Well, it is good to be back with you. I missed you as we were in East Tennessee visiting my in-laws. Take your Bible, turn to Psalm 131. Psalm 131. You may wonder, what is up with this pulpit up here today? And uh, I'll tell you a little brief story about this pulpit. This is Martin Luther King weekend. Uh, and Martin Luther King Jr. preached behind this pulpit one time. And uh, I pastored the Highland Park Baptist Church in downtown Chattanooga, Tennessee. And uh, when we sold all of the property there in downtown Chattanooga and started over as a brand new church on the north side of town there, we sold everything inside the church. We had an estate sale and sold everything. And uh, Charity and I bought this pulpit. So... um, Every Martin Luther King weekend, I preach behind this pulpit uh, in honor of Martin Luther King and all that he stood for pertaining to uh, civil rights and the fact that Jesus wants us to reach people no matter the color of their skin. And uh, so anyway, that's that's the uh, homage to uh, racial reconciliation in our country is why we're standing behind this pulpit today. I keep it in my study. So uh, anyway, I'm sure some of you were thinking that looks very different considering it's a very contemporary stage in an old school pulpit. But uh, if you Googled Highland Park Baptist Church, Chattanooga, Martin Luther King, don't do it while I'm preaching though. But if you did that, you'd you'd be able to read about it. Really interesting stuff. Actually, the the very chapel where he preached uh, caught on fire last year, and it burnt to the ground. So uh, really, uh, really good news that nobody was in there, though. Uh, On a much more positive note than that, um, we are having some issues of space with our preschool. And as was mentioned earlier in the service, we are in need of more preschool workers, and uh, we are running out of space over there. So we are going to see some changes taking place in the preschool area uh, to be able to create more space and things like that. And so uh, Lori's nodding her head over there. So I think she's glad that we're pointing out we really need preschool volunteers. Uh, all that being said, um, today, uh, I've, I've really missed preaching, but today we're going to be looking at the topic of prayer. And we're in the midst of 21 days of prayer and fasting as a congregation And today we're looking at a message entitled, Four Simple Steps to a Personal Prayer Life. Four Simple Steps to a Personal Prayer Life. And when I was in East Tennessee last week, we encountered a mighty storm. And we saw a lake not too far from Kingsport, Tennessee, where my in-laws live. And um, I heard a story about what happened out on that lake. Uh, there was a boat that did not dock on that night. And as the storm raged, the captain realized that his boat was sinking really fast. So he called out, does anyone here on this boat know how to pray? And one man stepped forward and said, yes, sir, captain, I know how to pray. And the captain said, well, good. You pray while the rest of us put on our life jackets because we're one short. So... (laughs) I know it's a bad preacher joke, but thanks for laughing at it anyway. Uh, In all seriousness, Satan has taken the subject of prayer and turned it into many Christians' uh, thoughts of something that's more of a duty than a privilege. And I hope that as we've been in these 21 days of prayer and fasting, that you've been looking at prayer as indeed a privilege of the Christian walk. It's an honor to be able to connect directly with God, and we don't have to go through an intermediary or anything like that. Uh, prayer is such an opportunity to experience depth in your relationship with the Lord. And uh, I've got a simple definition of prayer for you, and here's what it is transferring your burdens to God. Transferring your burdens to God. That's just a really simple way to explain what prayer is transferring your burdens to God. Before I explain four simple steps, to a personal prayer life, I think it's important to debunk some myths of personal prayer, Uh, some myths about personal prayer. One, uh, here's a myth. You can only pray between 5 a.m. and 6 a.m. If you're super spiritual and you're really good at praying, you can only pray between 5 and 6 in the morning. That is not true. All right? Uh, I'm sure some of you are thinking, 
I've never been up at 5 a.m., so I wouldn't know what that's like. But um, I do want you to know you can pray at any time. Many people give up on prayer because they think the super spiritual people are praying in the wee hours. And if you can't pray then, you're not a good enough Christian. I just want you to know God hears you all the time. He does. Another uh, thing to debunk when it comes to prayer is that you must pray for at least one hour. You don't have to pray for a really long time. And I've got news for some of you with whom I eat not during these first 21 days of the year, but some of y'all pray really long prayers before we eat. You don't have to do that. (laughs) It's hard to get an amen out of this crowd, but I got an amen out of that one, so that's good. Um, Another, your prayer journal must sound like the Bible. Your prayer journal does not have to sound like the Bible. I encourage you to journal your prayers. I journal my prayers. I hear my study at the church. I have a little tiny book and I just write down uh, some prayers to the Lord on a consistent basis. But here's an excerpt out of my recent prayer journal. Lord, please help me to not be a jerk today. I mean, you don't have to speak in Elizabethan English or anything like that. I mean, Lord, please help me to not be a jerk today because I felt like I was a little rude to somebody the day before and the Lord convicted me about it. So I just prayed, Lord, please help me to not be a jerk today. It's, it's things like that where you're just keeping it real with the Lord. All that being said is form of introduction. Let's get into four simple steps to a personal prayer life. Are you ready for it? By the way, typically I'm an expositor, an expository preacher. Today's more of a topical sermon. So as, uh, as you kind of get used to the fact that we're not going to be taking one central text and exegeting that text, instead we're going to be taking... Uh, four different texts throughout the message, but we're going to start in Psalm 131. Here's point number one. Clear your mind. That's a step to personal prayer life. Clear your mind. A way to do that is to shut out other voices. Psalm 131 verse 2 says, But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. You know, as I was thinking about the preschool area, one of the blessings of our preschool area being right down the hallway over here is you can hear the kids when they're dropped off by their mom and dad. And you've heard me say this before. I think one of the most beautiful sounds in a church is the sound of of children rustling and bustling and sometimes even crying. But it's, it's a good noise to hear a bunch of kids in church. And um, when we have kids dropped off in the preschool area, often they do cry. But if you go over to the kid zone, kids just run into there, the older kids. And uh, that's what Psalm 131.2 is talking about. I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. Um, Your soul is restless and it's stressed out when it is not resting in God's bosom. The battle is in our minds and our minds are a part of our soul. Here's a very practical question for you. Anybody in here have a hard time sleeping? Raise your hand if you have a hard time sleeping. Man, there are a lot of you that have a hard time sleeping. Um, I'm not one of you. Sorry to brag about that. But uh, your mind starts to wander. You start thinking, hey, you need to go to the dry cleaner tomorrow. You, you forgot to do that today. Or why didn't that guy call you back? Or you better make sure that you're prepared for that meeting. And you start having all these random thoughts going through your mind as you're trying to get to bed. And I want, to, I want you to hear this verse and, and really pray this verse over you as I talk about clearing your mind. Psalm 62, verses 1 and 5. For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. Verse 5. For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence. For my hope is from him. Do you know what David was telling his soul? Just be quiet. 
try to get to the place where your mind can just be quiet before God. You know, one of the biggest struggles that you express to me when we sit down in my study or I sit down in your home or we we sit down over lunch together, one of the biggest struggles that I know that our congregation faces is a struggle of being tired, stressed. Our congregation's brains are fried. And I think it's because we as a Western culture, particularly as Americans, are too busy and we don't sit in silence enough. Paul Miller, in the book A Praying Life, which is a fantastic text, said learning to pray doesn't offer us a less busy life. It offers us a less busy heart. So one, clear your mind. That's a great step to a strong personal prayer life. Try to clear your mind. And God will help you do that. Number two, focus your mind. Focus your mind. Focus on God's voice. Flip over to the left a little bit to Psalm 100, verse 4. Many of you have this verse memorized as we talk about focusing your mind. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Now, how do we come into the presence of God? I don't know about you. I primarily do that via musical worship. And almost every time I hear somebody talking about their, their quiet time or their Bible reading time or, or whatever you call it, your devotions, uh, almost every time I hear people talk about that, they mention two things, prayer and reading the Bible. But I feel like a lot of people leave out musical worship in their consistent time with the Lord. Now, according to the book of Isaiah, Lucifer primary, primarily ruled over musical worship to God when he was in heaven before his fall. So who do you think wants to stop you from worshiping God musically? Satan. Satan. Read Isaiah 15, Isaiah 51. You you can see this. Satan wants to stop you from musically worshiping God. Worship wars in churches have really been spun off from Satan himself for decades now in America. And what helps me focus my mind after clearing it is worshiping the Lord through music. And I'm not even a musical guy. When I'm not listening to worship music, I pretty much never listen to just the radio. I listen to sports talk and political talk and audio books and things like that. But I'm not even a musical guy. But I'm telling you, there is something special about singing to the Lord, especially after you clear your mind, that helps you to focus your mind on God. Can I encourage you that when we sing together as a congregation, that you would actually sing? That you wouldn't just stand there, but you would sing to the Lord. You say, well, I don't really like that song or much of any of the songs that we sing or anything like that. Well, it's not about you. Number three, pray your mind. Talk to God. Pray your mind. Simply pray what is on your heart. If you want to have simple steps to a personal prayer life, pray your mind. Again, here's my simple definition of prayer. Transferring your burdens to God. And if you're still burdened when you are leaving your prayer closet, then you shouldn't have been leaving your prayer closet. Prayer is simply talking with God and 
I encourage you to talk to God the way you would talk with your best friends. Philippians 4, 6 through 7, it says, Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You say, man, how could I be anxious for nothing? You have no idea the anxiety that I experience. I mean, wouldn't we say that worry and anxiety is one of the biggest struggles that we have? What's the key to receiving God's peace, which surpasses all understanding? It's guarding your heart and your mind in Christ. By praying about everything. So let your requests be made known to God. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 teaches us that. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Now, how many of you say the phrase, take care? Don't raise your hand, but I mean, you say, take care. Uh, Take care. What does that mean? It means be careful, be cautious. And I was reading 1 Peter 5, 7 this week, and I just started thinking, I don't really like that saying, take care. Why? Why? Because I'm supposed to cast my cares upon him. I'm not supposed to take care. Cast all your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. Give him all of the burden. I say to God, take worry, take stress, take, take anxiety from me, Lord. Number four, renew your mind. Let God talk to you. Renew your mind. Let God talk to you. Can I just encourage you to do this? Read the Word of God every day. Every day. You say, you have no idea how busy I am. Look, you can figure out a way to read the Bible every day. If we looked at how many times you looked at Facebook on your phone and how many times you watched a show on Netflix... I guarantee you could find somewhere in your schedule time to talk with God and time for God to talk with you through reading of the Bible. The reading of the Bible causes my thoughts to line up with his thoughts. Think about it this way. If you worked out with weights once once a month, how much do you think that would really help you? Probably not too much, just once a month. But every day, if you worked out with weights every day, you'd be a beast. Romans 12, 2, it says, Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So here's another question. How will you not be conformed to the world? How will you be transformed It's by the renewal of your mind. And how is your mind renewed? It's by God talking to you. Consider this your little pep talk that you need every once in a while to get in the word. Get in the word. God revolutionized my life once I started reading the Bible consistently. And he can do the same for you. The more you read the word, your mind is renewed and you think more like how God thinks. Hebrews 4.12, it says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. When I read the word of God, it it divides between me, my motives, and God's motives. There are some people who simply just don't think in the faith realm enough. And the reason why is because they're not in the Word enough. Get in the Word consistently. You say, I feel like I'm in a spiritual rut. Get in the Word. Romans 10, 17 says, So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. 
The way to become a man or a woman of faith is that you know the Word. So the way to be in the Word consistently is to memorize the Word, to read the Word, to study the Word, meditate on the Word, and that will give you faith. Psalm 119.105, your word is a lamp to my feet and it's a light unto my path. God's word will guide your life and I I really hope that you're going to take this pep talk seriously and get in the word consistently. You ever wondered this? You ever wondered why did God give his children manna every day? Children of Israel got manna every day. Why didn't he give it to them every week? Because I don't know about you. I I go to Walmart typically about once a week. I don't go every day. That would torture me badly. (laughs) But we go about once a week to to gather our, our food up and all that stuff. But man, going every day. But God gave the children of Israel manna every day instead of just help giving them supplies and letting them put it in their proverbial pantry. What was he trying to symbolize? He was symbolizing that we need it daily. We need it daily. When the Lord Jesus was teaching the disciples to pray, he said in Matthew 6, 11, give us this day our daily bread. Not this week, not this month, but daily bread. And just a few days after that, Matthew chapter 4, Jesus was being tempted in the desert, in the wilderness. And Jesus said to Satan in Matthew 4, 4, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. God has a word for you every day. He does. So I've given you four simple steps to help you to pray. Clear your mind, shut out other voices. Number two, focus your mind, focus on God's voice. Number three, pray your mind, talk to God. Number four, renew your mind, let God talk to you. And it reminds me of this great quote from the pastor Craig Rochelle in Oklahoma City. If you speak to God in private, he will speak through you in public. I close out the message with this. Uh, I don't know how many of you saw the terrible situation that happened with DeMar Hamlin, the football player for the Buffalo Bills. But when he collapsed, we were watching it live at my in-law's house and watching those football players surround him in prayer, it just really spoke to me. And Josh Allen, the quarterback for the Buffalo Bills, he said, I haven't been the the most spiritual of all people, but God's really gotten a hold of me lately. I'm paraphrasing, but he said something to that effect. Thank the Lord DeMar Hamlin's doing better now, but days later, NFL football teams from all around the country, they were having moments of silence. And during those moments of silence, they weren't just standing there like this. They were literally getting on their knees and praying to the Lord. ESPN reporter Dan Orlovsky got on live TV on what's typically a very distant network from God. And he prayed specifically to the one true God. I'm telling you, I feel like there's just an openness to prayer right now that there hasn't been in a while here in our country. And I've given you some simple steps for you to be able to step it up in your prayer life. And the Lord seems to be opening up doors of opportunity for a conversation about prayer to become more prevalent. Here in our church, we're doing 21 days of prayer and fasting. And I've heard so many of you tell me about what the Lord's doing in your personal prayer life. But I want to encourage you today to say, you know what? I I understand that I need to pray. I need to be in the word daily. 
And I'm going to make a commitment to the Lord that I'm going to do that at least over this next week and just see what he does. Right now, I want to encourage you to stand up with me very quietly, very reverently. As you stand, you've heard a message from the Bible today. And in this message from the Bible, you've, you've heard about Jesus, you've heard about prayer, and I want to mesh those two things together for a moment. You need to pray to Jesus and commit your life to him. If you've never taken a moment to confess that you're a sinner, to believe on the Lord Jesus so that you can be saved, then I want to encourage you that you would do that today. It's a very simple prayer. You pray something that goes like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I confess to you that I'm a sinner. I believe that you're the one true God and I commit my life to you, Lord. If you want to give your life to Christ, then in a moment when after I pray, you come forward and you say, I got to get saved. I want to, I want to pray that prayer. And you repent of your sins and you give your life to Christ. Others of you, maybe you have given your life to Jesus and you're saying, you know, I just really got to step it up in my prayer life. I feel, I feel convicted about that as the message has been delivered. I want to encourage you to get down on your knees today. Maybe it's on your knees there or up here at the front. But you come and pray. Maybe you want somebody to pray over you. I'd love to pray over you, pray with you. Pastor Jacob will be up here as well. If you want somebody to pray over you about something or someone, you come forward. Maybe you want to be like, there were three families this past week that went through our new members class and they joined our church. I want to encourage you, if if you're interested in joining our church family, begin that process by coming forward and praying. Maybe you have a physical need, a health-related issue, and you need prayer. I encourage you to come. So I'm going to pray right now, and when I close the prayer with the word amen, you walk forward, you make a decision for Christ. Lord Jesus, we pray that anybody in here today who needs to make any decision for you, that they would come. Have them follow your will, Lord. And if they feel any burden whatsoever to walk forward, to pray, to walk forward, to make a decision for you, to get down on their knees and pray to you, we pray, Lord, that they would follow that nudge of the Holy Spirit of God right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.